Kate, you there? Okay, I am here. <laughs> we have made it. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, can I get a thumbs up? Do I, can you hear me okay? All right, that's excellent. Okay, so I am going to begin by saying uh, thank you for being here. I am really I'm really disappointed that I'm not with you. That taking uh, getting today pulled off on our end was uh, was a an act of of group effort, and I want to introduce a couple people to you. Um, and uh, I'd like to first introduce Emily Cisco from Glass Education. She is uh, responsible for everything cool 3D printed that you're going to see today. Uh, she's the master of our 3D printer, and we're going to lose her to a graduate program in just a little while. And I'd also like to introduce you to uh, Zach Meredith. Uh, yes, there is a commonality there. My godson is, uh, before he goes to graduate school in the Netherlands, is taking some time here at Glass Education to up our um, our presence in terms of how we look on camera and our video editing. So, And he's also working on a couple projects supervising interns this summer. So there's a ton of people here at Glass Education who participated in making today possible every, you know, everything from bringing me coffee to guarding the door because uh, we moved into a new building last year and uh, the community still thinks we've reopened a resale shop. So I'm just going to pretend that you're all laughing at my jokes right now. And we're going to hope that all the technology holds out for the duration of this presentation. Um, my boots on the ground today are Dan Reichert. I hope that right now he's taking a bow. Uh, Dan is, I've been working with Dan for a few years and I know you all know him well. Um, he has come with my suitcase full of stuff and he will uh, take bribes after the presentation in order to take home um, the suitcase because I don't want to ship it back to Wisconsin. So with that, we're going to get started uh, with uh, things about um, accessibility and glass education. When we left your keys observatory a couple of years ago, four years ago now, almost uh, we had to reinvent ourselves and we've had to do it a couple of times. And it ended up to be the, the best possible thing that ever happened to us as an organization in the worst possible way. But what it has done, it has given us a chance to, uh, to really focus in on the area of accessibility. And when I came to the conference a couple of years ago, I brought a suitcase full of the things that we'd started to invent. And we have continued to work in that direction. And I'm only gonna show you a piece of things. So right now we've spent a lot of our time working with people with visual impairments, but I want to emphasize to everyone that when you work in an area of a sensory disability, so if you're accommodating for either a visual disabilities or hearing disabilities, that in the process of accommodating for those, you're going to hit a lot of other um, disability areas. So I'm hoping that in the next time I present, I'm really going to be able to focus in on the deaf and hard of hearing community. But today you're going to hear and see a lot of the work that we're doing with the blind and visually impaired. So with that, let's take a look at our, I've got to make sure I'm on the right slide here. I'm going to continue. So um, just as a little setup, I know for most of you, I don't have to explain to you why it's important to try and make everything we do accessible. But for just a little bit of a setup, I want you to think about how many beautiful books and images that children as you know, as Avery is growing up in astronomy, how many things that he's seeing in books and um, and how many images and stories that you are exposed to that become part of your incidental learning and that that as you grow and you get into the science of those things and the interpretation and your capacity, your sophistication grows, that that has some place to plant. And people with vision disabilities don't get that. So accessibility starts from very young students and grows up. And when we get to college, then it's a matter of looking at making the actual data, data manipulation, uh, all of those aspects accessible. So I'm going to try and look at more from the educational standpoint, younger students, high school students, what are we going to provide for them to help it so that um, that incidental learning and equity grows from a very young age. So in the suitcase, we're gonna start with the basic levels. And I want you to remember 
as I'm talking, that you don't have to try and do everything at once. Just pick something that you want to start with. What do you feel really excited about? What resources do you have? And don't feel like you have to do everything. We've been growing as we as we um, develop as an organization, as I bring in more professionals. We now finally have blind professionals working at Glass Education. We need to do the same for deaf and hard of hearing, mobility, to be a resource to the community. So think of us as a resource and think of me as encouragement to just start someplace. And where we typically start is with um, tactile graphics. And uh, the tactile graphics that Dan has, and I wish I could see him dancing around. You could have got to you know, show these things off and we'll pass those around. Tactile graphics are a way of providing an entry level um, explanation of different resources. And they're not that difficult to make. So I'm not going to go into depth. It's a whole presentation about how to make a good tactile graphic. And we, by the end of the summer, are planning to, let's make it fall. Uh, have a website available for you to access um, this kind of information for yourself. But tactile graphics, if you can have explanations in Braille, and Braille, even though you'd say it's not that common, but uh, 80% of the uh, blind professionals who are fully employed read Braille. Even though it's not that common, it is the pathway to a solid career and employment. So don't underestimate the power of Braille. And then also imagine that if we could, along with these tactile graphics, provide a sonification each time that we produce a tactile graphic. <laughs> and, the, um, and one of the, the projects that we've been working with for a number of years, run by PI, Dan Reichert, is the Afterglow software. And a couple of years ago, we worked with the team to try and start redesigning the software so that it would be more accessible. And if you want to learn about all of the accessibility features in Afterglow Access, there'll be a QR code at the end of this presentation that you can um, take a click on, and we will um, be hosting a workshop July 11, 12, and 18 to go over all the features, uh, accessibility features in Afterglow Access. So back to the story of building um, incidental learning in people with vision impairments. What if those images of galaxies and globular clusters always came in conjunction with a sonification. And I have shared my sound with you, so you should be able to see the example of the sonification tool that's available in Afterglow. And if I can find where my cursor went, there it is. I'm going to hit the sound on here so you can hear it too. So that's just an example of one sonification tool that is available. There are many available and, um, and they do different things. But the, what's unique about Afterglow Access is it allows you to sonify an entire FITS file. And uh, so we can, uh, if you join us in July, we'll go over all the features of this. But what you see here, if you notice on the screen that there is an ability to uh, zoom in using keyboard commands to different aspects of an image so that you can, and you can choose the granularity in which you want to hear that sonification. So there's a lot of different things that we will be exploring as we build this tool in the future. Also want to um, point out to people that there is a group that meets approximately monthly called the Sonification World Chat. If you want to know more about that group of people who are getting together to talk about development of sonification tools, I also know there are people at the conference who are part of the sonification world chat. So make that part of your, uh, your after hours conversations, find out who's part of that organization and check in with them. And there'll be an email address. Um, I, the, I believe that I've I've signed Ashley here at the office up to receive those. And we'll get you signed up for the next sonification world chat on June uh, the 28th. So moving off from um, sonifications, oh, you get to hear that again, let's go. I'm going to take you through some of the accessibility uh, tools that we have available at Glass that would take you from the uh, photon in uh, space all the way to the telescope and the CCD camera. Explaining a CCD camera is quite a challenge. So this picture here has is from our, one of our iData workshops with high school students. Uh, these tools were developed with these uh, students and they take, uh, they follow the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the photons, the waves from space all the way to the telescope. 
but we have to start at a star. I want to do a shout out to uh, Amelia Ortiz Gill, who developed the planetarium dome. And that is also in the suitcase. So show that off to the group. Dan, uh, you pass that around. That dome is extremely helpful for helping uh, people with blindness or low vision get a grasp on where you might be starting your story from. So tell a story about the sky, tell a story about uh, the stars, get, help people get oriented. If you're blind or low vision, but um, even if you're low vision, the idea that the sky is a dome is a really difficult concept. So um, starting with something tactile is really helpful. So the next thing I want to show you here, and we're going to practice up our, our fancy camera switches here. Um, and I can't find my, oops. Let's see. Zach, help me out here. Okay, we're going to go to the table camera. And I'm going to show you, when we're talking about magnitude, we have this tool here. I wasn't able to send you one of these. I hope you can see this well enough. This is called a, our force keyboard. And this was a design that was developed through the iData project. And instead of explaining magnitude, trying to use the concept of brightness, we're using um, it to explain magnitude with a force. So each one of these keys covers a magnitude starting with a low to high intensity, um, intensity brightness of stars. And so using force to interpret magnitude on a logarithmic scale. And what we've done is have a number of these different keyboards so you can do a comparison. We're doing studies on this right now to see, can people interpret them? How are they useful? What other scales do we need to have in conjunction with them so that people can understand brightness? Because brightness from a point source is difficult um, in light polluted areas. And it's very difficult for people who um, are maybe just able to see the stars. The differing brightnesses are, are difficult. So the force keyboard is um, in design and development. We actually have a patent on this and uh, you'll be able to see more about that um, in the coming, in the coming um, months. So, so that is our magnet force keyboard. Let me get back over to my screen here and click on here. So the other thing I want to show you is um, the, um, the, I didn't get these sent with us. So we're over here again. So back onto our screen. So when you're talking about pointing a telescope, sometimes it's important to have a very simple model of that telescope. So this model allows you to set it up and understand as you're talking to people about how telescopes move. This one has, um, the one you have on screen, it's held together with Velcro, so it makes a sound when you move it in uh, right ascension and declination. Um, you can, uh, you're able to help people understand how telescopes move with very simple models. This one 3D printed, that's very inexpensive to print. So it's, um, that's one of the things that makes this model particularly helpful. There's also um, a lot of, uh, uh, landmarks for different features on the telescope. So moving back to my presentation now, um, we will move along. I wanna introduce you to the tactile telescope. This is one that we, um, Dan has, and I don't really want it back. So, but Dan thinks he wants to return it to me because it's a precious piece of object. You just uh, take him out for one of his uh, Reichert nebulas and, um, and see what you can uh, score to take home with you. So a tactile telescope, if we wanna explain the light path of a telescope to anybody, uh, young people who we don't want touching our telescopes with their sticky fingers uh, or anybody, this allows you to put your hands on the primary mirror, the secondary mirror. We, uh, you can see on this particular model up in the corner, you can see that um, the, even the lens has been the eyepiece has been cut away and people can see the multiple lenses that make up an eyepiece. So this is a very handy tool. We're going to have to do a little bit more work about on that in order to, um, in, to, in order to make that telescope um, really tactily pleasant to, to touch. And we'd like to find a way to make that uh, something that we can manufacture more of in the future. Also in your, um, I want to encourage people to take advantage of 3D printing. 
of having different telescopes in your hand and talking about where they're, what kind of electromagnetic radiation they are um, producing, or uh, producing, capturing, uh, is really helpful. So um, Emily has done an amazing job here at Glass of taking uh, models that already exist. And then we ask the question, what else do we need to do to this model in order for it to explain the concept that we want to teach in astronomy? So we want to teach about pointing the telescopes. We want to teach about um, how where the light path is. So she goes through these models and changes them so that they're able to be uh, moved and manipulated in a way that, that makes them better teaching tools. So we don't want things that are static because then you have to ask, say, ask people to just use their imagination. Um, people who are who have low vision or even people who are on the autism spectrum and really want to handle things, uh, have tactor, um, sensory other sensory inputs, and this is really important. So we'll have these models available to you. They're already available on the web, but the modified version has been provided to you by Emily here at Glass Education. So moving on to the next one. Um, when we're also talking about sky orientation, I said that explaining the dome of the sky to someone with low vision is difficult. So we do have plans. I brought, uh, did not send one of these with you, but we do have full plans for how to stitch a dome umbrella. Those of you who were born in the or 60s or before, remember in the 70s, the bubble umbrella that was the, uh, was, you know, you could really look cool at the bus stop if you had one of those. So we're taking those and stitching them. So you have the R and deck, ecliptic, celestial sphere, um, and then you can even put constellations on them and show the motion of the sky. That is very helpful for anybody learning about um, sunrise, sunset. Um, they're great at star parties, and you can even buy ones that are pre-printed on the bottom, but they're not full dome. So you can just do um, circumpolar stars with those um, telescopes, the cool ones off of Amazon. So moving along, in your packet of things, you should, um, in the suitcase, you just have a simple model of waves. So when you're starting to talk about waves, even if you think it's just, you're just talking about waves. Anytime you can get a tactile uh, anything in someone's hands, it is gonna help um, anchor their uh, reasoning as you explain a concept. So very, very simple models like the one that in, it's in the suitcase that is just a tracing of, um, of a electromagnetic wave. Now I'm gonna explain, talk, you, talk to you about a, uh, a activity that is a long time in the development. And what you see here on your screen right now is the one that we were trying to teach about the different sizes, frequencies, and wavelengths of different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this particular model had a ton of pins in it. And it was a great thing for explaining, but you know, it got to be a little sharp. And so we've been working a long time here at Glass to make this a little different. The one you have there in my suitcase is the, um, is the one that we've made out of puzzle pieces. And so as you go through, there's a number of different ways you can use this. You can use it as an anchor for any kind of lesson or lesson on its own. And you're looking at the seven sections of the electromagnetic spectrum and putting them in order. One of the things we're trying out at camp right this week is kind of a shopping bag approach where you're looking for different um, objects or pictures and each person has a shopping bag of objects and they have to sort until they get a shopping bag full of, of objects or telescopes that actually are all part of the same part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And when they're done and they think they have it, we will hand them a puzzle piece. Then their next task when everyone has their puzzle piece is to put them in order. Now, once you've done that, we all know that the misconception that we might be putting in here is that not everything occupies the same amount of space on the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we have even more learning to do to make this a little bit more tactile and to not, um, not uh, ignore the part that doing something physically can sometimes assist in anchoring that knowledge in your, um, in your long-term memory. So the lacing card has yet to be tested. I'm actually gonna show you, do we have the lacing card here? Um, I think I sent that to camp. So the lacing card uh, is uh, you just go ahead and try to have each one of the group members who have a different one of those 
those other cards with the, the, the wave already on it and see if they can lace um, one so that everyone has a different one from the longest wavelength to the shortest wavelength. And I'll, tell, I'll report back to you at the end of the week on Discord and let you know if we were successful at camp. I'm spending the rest of the week with 20 middle school students and it's about 32 degrees Celsius here. So wish me luck. I'll let you know how it comes out in the end. So the other, um, the one more, oops, let's go back here. So our, as far as the misconception goes, the last thing that we have done is printed um, and relative size on ribbon. So we just get fray free ribbon. Uh, our cricket comes in handy. We do some t-shirt um, stencils in the, with the words on them, iron them on, and then roll them out. So we've got the tiny little um, visible light spectrum, and then we have the giant uh, radio, and it gives the students an understanding of the relative uh, amount of space that each frequency takes up on the EM spectrum. So that one you also have in the suitcase, and I'm happy to give that away. The last thing that we all really want our students to understand, whether they're, they're in middle school or college, we understand that the C how a CCD camera actually works. So whether you're making color images or whether you are just taking a single filter shot, um, you want them to understand that photons coming from space uh, interact with this camera and they're counting, they're counting electrons. They're not counting photons, they're counting the electrons. So we've come up with an interactive uh, role-playing activities that um, place the students in the place of a photon. Some students are the filters and some students are the counters on the CCD plate. So this activity started as um, small cards and large classroom size boards and has evolved so that it could be shipped to you in a suitcase or put on a website with that you can make easily in your classroom. So there's a number of different versions. This shows you the, this picture is of the first version of the cards that we made with, or this game that we made with the uh, innovators developing accessible tools for aston astronomy uh, curriculum. And we wanted to make this a little bit smaller, more compact. We moved to having the cards, we had the cards with colorful beads on it. So each color photon had a different color and a different shape. You count those, they go to the filter. If it's a blue filter, they only count the blue ones. They pass that information on to the person who's uh, being the CCD camera. And then they put the, the same color um, tell, or sticky velcro -y dots onto the um, space on the, the board. And there's we've only a nine pixel camera that we have here, but they get the idea that each pixel on the camera gets photons from the telescope that are then counted as electrons on the CCD chip. So that has also evolved into a 3D printed version so that all of the different tack, they're now simply tactile. So each card has a, um, the, a number associated with it that corresponds with the board and the students count the different shapes, pass it on and um, et cetera. So we have yeah. this all written up. It'll be available for you online in the fall. We're gonna wanna hear from you if you wanna uh, be alerted when that goes up. So this activity also, the last thing we want to make sure that we have is the, um, the ability to talk about the photometry. So what we ultimately want to do is we want to get down to the um, afterglow access, the using of that software. We want blind students and every student to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So we're going to talk more this afternoon about remote telescopes. We have a discussion about that, about the black box that these things sometimes get put in. Photometry is a tough, tough topic. So we've made some hands-on tools to start discussing uh, photometry. You can use the ones that Dan is showing you either as part of the, ac the activity with the board, or you can do simple things like get a large egg carton uh, with, and uh, Carl Pennypacker can, as the originator of that one, you guys can learn how to uh, just apply the, uh, a hands-on version of understanding photometry to your repertoire. So we're still at the camera. All of the things you've been seeing so far are, uh, you know, come down from history through the uh, data project, which is part of the a National Science Foundation Award. I want to acknowledge that. And 
The Paul M. Angel Family Foundation has given us a lot of resources in order to develop, to buy a 3D printer farm and keep it going here at Glass Education. And we've got, um, and to test out our products. Other things that we're working with, working with Dan and his team uh, on the multi-wavelength universe, we're trying to tackle things like how to model um, pulsars. So there's a few different models here. We're taking models that exist, inventing things. As you can see, I have a son with, who loves lacrosse. I have a ton of old lacrosse balls. You could do a lot drilling holes in lacrosse balls. Once we perfect that, we'll have that uh, model up, but we're trying to model the features that uh, educators are trying to teach in their objectives. So what we try to do is tie any tactile model that we do to the learning objectives of the educators. So it's fun kind of playing the astronomy good fairy on this. I want to spend a little bit of time, and Michael, you're going to have to cut me off because I'm totally losing track of time. But um, I wanted to introduce you to a project that I'm really proud of, and it's probably my favorite project here at Glass Education. It's called the Tactile Galaxy Cards. And you have a, a pack of them there, and Dan's going to toss, uh, toss them around. <laughs> He's going to pass them around. And you can take a look at these. Every single thing on these cards has been thought out over the last three years and redesigned. When we started this project, we didn't even have the ability to do a, a fine enough 3D prints to make these possible. So a host of people have gone into providing a tactile model that has actual information on it. We've made color a non-visual, so we've actually calculated the color for these objects that are on the cards. Do, done some features and can do things with them. The back of the card has a Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectra on it. And, um, and that uh, spectra is, uh, is accurate. And we've labeled both the, um, the object, the uh, absorption and emission lines in on that. And I had a, if I can see my cursor somewhere in here, like the right thing. Yes, I'm going to show you uh, just because Zach is so good with the camera here. We have a time, six hour time lapse of producing one of these cards with one of our Prusa printers. So, uh, and, and Emily has spent a great time making sure that we can pr uh, produce these without them warping and get the right filament. We've even discovered that uh, the kind of filament that you use is important on this. So we're hoping to apply all our lessons learned to producing other things, other object um, content in the future. So we've also, um, thanks to, uh, to the folks at Tactile Universe, we even have a holder for these. There's 52 cards in this deck and they're all associated with real data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I said, ultimately our, um, our goal to, uh, to make sure that students have uh, access to, uh, to, to graphics, to incidental learning, but then when they get to the upper levels that they still have access to go where their curiosity takes them. So in back of these 52 cards, there's still Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, data and some fun games to play. So this, you have a picture here of uh, two of our contractor staff people here at Glass doing the focus groups and testing on playing. We've played Go Fish with these. We can successfully play dominoes. You don't need vision to do this. And, uh, and teaching about the spectra, the chemistry behind them. So you can go deep or you can stay at the middle school level with these. So um, they're, they're proving to be pretty versatile. As I said, they're Sloan. All the Sloan information is connected with these cards so that if you want to um, have this part of uh, a greater research project that's available, and I want to let you know that there is a huge team of people who have been working on this over the years. So this also makes for a really good project for uh, undergraduate students who are interested in accessibility, interested in data management, interested in problem solving, because <laughs> there's a lot of them. This has been uh, an excellent uh, internship project for many people and Ranger, the um, office dog keeps us all sane. Thanks to the folks at Tactile Universe for uh, coming up with the original designs for this and the ways, uh, the use of Blender to make, uh, to make these work. Nick Bon is pictured here and he, uh, we hope after COVID, we get to see him here again at Glass. So uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap this up. There's a QR code up here for you if you are interested in joining us for the Afterglow Access Workshop in July. 
if you join us and you would like to, what we want to do is come up with some uh, professional development um, plans, ways of using this, ideas. So there is a stipend involved if you uh, help us do some work on this as well. If you're interested in the Sonification World Chat, please reach out to Ashley at Glass Education. And with that, I will call it good and take some questions.